Does the hero feel like a coward when his friends die? Does the hero see failure in victory because he lived where the true heroes died? The Impra protects. Warhammer 40,000, once the most niche of all sci-fi series, is now finally going mainstream. It was indeed a most unexpected rise that shows that story and lore matter. All Warhammer 40k was, both in the 80s at its inception and today, is a tabletop war game. Yeah, the most obscure kind of nerding is now a multi-billion dollar franchise enjoyed the world over. And still, there's not like any 40k commercials. There's a few more now, but still it's very understated. There's not any media blitzes for it either. And still, people, via word of mouth, are able to find out about it and buy all that sweet, sweet paint and models. The game is just that good, or so I'm told. Back in the day, I I disparaged it as an overpriced hobby for assholes. But what a twist. I was the asshole for judging a game without playing it. And once fear of Grandfather Nurgle subsides, I will be giving the tabletop game of 40k a try. So what the hell is 40k anyway? Warhammer 40, oh, 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 I mean, uh, 40, zero, 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 wait, I think that's enough zero. It's an epic science fantasy universe in the grand tradition of Star Wars, uh, if Star Wars was run by Dark Vador and Emperor Seltine. It's a darker science fantasy universe than Star Wars, but not nearly as dark as the memes would lead you to believe. Sure, there are some super dark elements, but those are usually in the background, and there are many characters that either go against them or at the very least complain about them. The the universe is filled with a bunch of factions, but the main mover and shaker is the Imperium of Man, aka the Imperials, but with an I instead of an E. Also unlike in Star Wars, the Imps here are the good enough guys, or they are the heroes this universe deserves. It is run by the immortal god emperor of mankind. He is a bit out of it at the moment, due to having his shit kicked in about 10,000 years prior to the setting by a wayward demigod son named Horus. He is comatose, but he powers a psychic lighthouse called the Astronomission. See how fucking epic this bloody universe is? It's like an Iron Maiden album come to life, or come to universe form, whatever. So FTL, we all want it so we can expand across the galaxy at a pace people can actually get excited about and also have fun with. So in order to go FTL in Warhammer 40,000, you have to go through the warp. No nice and friendly Runberry warp, instead it's the Alex Kurtzman warp, AKA hell. And in hell, you got four gods of the warp. Kathleen Kennedy, a.k.a. Zinch, the Lord of Lies, Nurgle, the Lord of K, Slanesh, the Lord of Deviantart, and finally, Korn, the God of War. These entities are the greatest threat the galaxy faces, along with Oryx, Tyranids, Necrons, and flagging minisails. The Imperials, while not always good, are at least better than getting nommed or turned into a chaos spawn. The 40k universe, like Star Wars, can have all sorts of epic stories or smaller scale human stories. There are really two types of 40k stories. You have Baroque 40k. These novels have super epic stories of Lovecraftian creepiness where the protagonist might be doomed, but they shall still slay in the name of the Emperor before they go. Baroque 40k will also have pages upon pages of descriptions, and those descriptions will be suitably epic or silly, like um, candles, speaking tubes, and human skin star maps on their main starships. Yeah, I can buy the human skin star maps, but candles? Really? That, that seems like, um, moving on. These Baroque 40k stories can also potentially be combined with human stuff for really memorable stories. One such really memorable story is Dead Sky, Black Sun. It's a story wherein two space bros literally head to hell to take down an actually competent warlord. You then have grounded 40k stories. This is your basic military SF where you got normal humies facing off against the dark. Many 40k stories are not really dark at all, and some are just straight hero classic, such as our novel today. 40k is more than what memes the eye. Hey, get that bolter out of my face. Ah, you gotta love machine empathy. It's a playground of epic dudes battling it out with fell foes. Sometimes they win, and sometimes they get torch of raw eternity. But most of the time, they kick the shit out of enemies and live to serve the Emperor another day. Kaifus Kane! I reviewed his first three books at my YouTube inception in 2009, and despite the cringiness of those videos, people ate that shit up. And I got a comment way back then asking me to review this very novel. Well, I'm glad it took 11 years, because now we have 20% 
20% less cringe. Kyphus Kane, like his universe, is in the grand tradition of Star Wars. He is basically the 40k equivalent of Han Solo. He is charismatic, cool, and he is an artist with a chainsword and lads gun. He has a bro that is shaggy, strong, and able to snipe like Night Hole Reviews. Scrounge up any part, and most importantly, he drives like a madman. Although, said bro is not a Wookiee or any sort of foul Xenos, but instead a very tragic man. Jurgen is Kane's best bud, and Kane in every book reminds us that he has a distinctive odor. In Star Wars, Chewie is supposed to have smelt quite pleasant. Jurgen doesn't really smell, but instead he is a psychic blank. Think Ysela Mary from Heir to the Empire, and if you don't know what that is, please go back to Normie Tube. Unlike in Star Wars, being able to negate the hardcore force, aka hell, aka the warp, means you have no soul, which means people are weirded out by your very presence, and this can manifest itself in a bunch of ways. For Jurgen, this disquiet is manifested as a foul odor, but hey, at least people don't hate him on sight like some blanks. Kane himself is also a tragic character. He is a true hero like Han, but he has major PTSD. Han was a celebrity, but not to the extent that Kane is. Kane's glory is used all across the Imperium to bolster morale and get more meat for the grinder. Kane's exploits are renowned across all social strata and he is feted everywhere he goes. But he feels guilty. He survived where the true heroes died. He has the glory where all the true heroes simply rest in obscurity. And this guilt is manifested by him calling himself a coward. The novels are all told in first person perspective and are part of a hidden Kane archive. Kane wrote the events in the novels during his dotage. And if you read between the lines, you will find that he is not quite as cowardly as he and the fandom would lead you to believe. It is my determination that he never was quite as scared as he said he is, but rather he had the natural fear of getting killed, and he had the very natural wariness of not wanting to get tossed face first into the bloody meat grinder that is the 40k universe. The Kane archive was discovered by Kane's waifu, a hot chick named Amberly Vale. Think a hardcore amalgamation of Princess Leia and Mara Jade. She is an inquisitor of the Ordo Xenos, and in the Kane novels, she will leave footnotes explaining things and will have in-universe documents flesh out what Kane does not. She is also a big ass motherfucker or badass motherfucker I like mine better and she and Kane engage in the sexy times repeatedly throughout their relationship Kane was a lot like Han before he got a big ass girlfriend wait Carrie Fisher wasn't juice uh, never mind anyway in Kane's adventures prior to Amberly he had a girl in every port or ship or what have you and after Kane and Amberly meet Kane settles down with her more or less so by reading between the lines Amberly wouldn't get with a space pussy meaning that Kane is lying about his cowardice or B Amberly could be lying and perhaps just perhaps an inquisitor Kyphus Kane put out a bit of disinformation to throw off his foes. Whatever the case may be, Kane is a true hero, just like Han, and Jurgen is the best sidekick second only to Chewbacca himself. They are a duo of the most ascendant justice, and today we are looking at his finest adventure, Death or Glory. Death or Glory was written way back in 2006 by the sole writer of the Kyphus Kane series, Sandy Mitchell. This novel stands out in the Kane series as it is the earliest novel chronologically, despite being the fourth published. This novel is set about a decade, give or take, before the first novel in the series, and as such, Amberly does not put in an appearance. But there is a footnote saying that she was late arriving to a planet where Kane had to fight some foul Xenos, meaning that perhaps the Emperor had taken an early interest in Kane's love life. Death or Glory is also part of a loose trilogy of sorts called the Perilla Trilogy. The only person who calls it that is me, but hey, it's got to start somewhere. The action for Death or Glory takes place on a planet called Perilla, and both the planet and what's on it drives the plots of two other novels. Duty Calls is this novel's direct sequel, and Kane's Last Stand, which is the latest novel chronologically in the series. So, with all that out of the way, let's finally see what the hell Kane is up to. In this edition of Kaifa's Kane, Hero of the Imperium, we find Kane and his faithful aide Jurgen en route to the beleaguered world of Perilla. Perilla is a backwater of the Imperium, and it is being besieged by the foul orcs. At this point in Kane's career, he has not had to face orcs, and thus he lacks the proper respect for them. The holy book of memes that is the Imperial Infantryman's uplifting primer says that orcs 
Sharks are slow-witted and weak. Must have got their info from INN or the 40k version of Slate. Kane is at this time of his career working with an arty unit, so he feels that he will have a nice time of it while the battery rains high explosive death upon the middling orcs. Lucky for Kane, things go a bit awry when the ship he is on is attacked by the foul greenies. Orcs, while simple in theory, are often villains that surprise the arrogant Imperials. Sure, they do enjoy a good crumpin, but remember Gork is brutal cunning, and Mork is cunning brutality. Or is it the other way around? Ah well. Wah! It the ship gets hit by a torpedo, and Kane and his buddies have to try to make it to an airtight compartment. Alas for Kane, but awesome for us, he and Jurgen are forced to make a run for it to an escape pod. In other works, Kane and Jurgen would have like 10 minutes before they get to Perilla. In 40k, shit happens way slower, and Sandy Mitchell gives Kane legitimate character development, instead of just using him as a self-insert. Since this is early in Kane's career, and since he is about to be put right smack dab in the greenies, Duke Nukem style, Sandy gives Kane in-story reason to be so good, and he will do this throughout the Kane series. Series. Kane and Jurgen take three weeks to make it to the planet, and during that time, Kane trains with his chainsword. Shad would be pleased. And thus, after an epic crash landing, Kane is ready to slice and dice. And he does this during this novel's tutorial section. Kane and Jurgen immediately after crashing have to fight some trash mobs, and the early fights are quite entertaining and really shows the scary side of the orc. Orcs are seven foot tall green rage monsters that are as dumb as a mule and twice as ugly. Actually, that does disservice to the mule. They are at least four times as smelly as an unwashed mule, or at least the average neckbeard. The orcs are armed with axes and guns that would make Jimenez and other Ring of Mire, am I right? Manufacturers scoff with derision. But despite these rather poor weapons, the orcs are strong and vicious killers, and can take a crap ton of punishment to put down. Imagine the health pools from goddamn Gears of War 1 here. Kane and Jurgen crash down on a continent that has been taken over by orcs, although they won't know this until later in the novel. The orcs, despite their memes, are still stone cold bastards and have killed pretty much everyone sans a few survivors here and there. So Kane is stuck in a post orcalyptic environment. Kane, despite calling himself a coward, does not hide in a cave Osama style, and instead steals an orc truck, and he and Jurgen set out on a course for wackiness. They find a destroyed town called Prosperity Wells, and since this is a prequel, it's not a spoiler to say that they fuck some orc shit up. The town would later be renamed Kane's Head, and the grateful townspeople would build a massive clock where on the hour, a wooden giggity, Kane would smack an orc with a hammer. Kane, as you would expect, wanted to blow it up, but unlike with Cadia, it would survive the trepidations of Failbadon. All Kane books have epic deeds pulled off by Kane. While in town, Kane and Jurgen get a radio transmission on their Vox Beats, aka portable radios. They're able to contact a surviving squad and set a time to meet up. But then, some orcs attack, and Kane and Jurgen shoot the shit out of them and chop them up, but alas, there's too many and they have to retreat. They retreat to a garage, aka Carhold, hold up there to hatch a plan to deal with the town's fuck ton of orcs. Kane is a bit of an improviser and is able to cobble together a bomb out of some industrial solvents and an 18-wheeler. See, lads and lasses, it pays to have a high int. Don't just use it as a dump stat. After Kane uses his improvised bomb, he meets up with a squad of cool dudes led by a one Sergeant Tiber. This is a PDF squad. Think local militia. Kane is a member of the Imperial Guard, aka Astro, we can trademark this Militarum. So he looks down on them at first, but you can't blame him since most are crap. Tiber squad is filled with some cool dudes that get just enough characterization to be memorable. Kane and Tiber come up with a plan to steal some cars from Honest Bone Crush's used orc truck lot. But Tiber has an ulterior motive. 40k has a lot of betrayal in its books, to the point of it being a bit of a meme. Since this is the Kane book, it's a hero classic betrayal. Tiber tricks Kane into rescuing some civvies on top of getting some of those sweet, sweet orc 150s. Kane is pissed, but pissed like Han Solo would be. Sure, he's mad, but he doesn't shoot Tiber or leave the humans behind for the orcs to kill, and instead takes him in his care. So cowardly. And so the first quarter of the book ends with the first of many Kane bangs. Giggy. Kane has Rocket Man below the town. Giggity with a well-placed rocket to the space gas pump. In later years, Kane would regret this as Kane's head would have that clock, a fate which is truly worse than death. The rest of the novel follows the adventures of the army of Kane. Uh, wait, no, this isn't Command and Conquer. Kane's heroes is what they are known in universe. And the rest of the novel is more or less a road book. 
Kane's true character is forged here as well, and I think that we have a few references to sort out. One, Kane and Co are in a desert, and two, Kane's Heroes is likely a nod to the World War II film Kelly's Heroes, which was also kind of a road film a little bit. The desert adventure is likely a nod either to Lawrence of Arabia or Moses leading his people through the desert. Although thankfully, Kane isn't on a desert bus, and thus it doesn't take 40 bloody years. Kane is certainly forged in this novel. He goes from fairly good combatant to expert combatant. He also levels up his leadership skill as well. He is no longer a RMF. Instead, he is now a frontline commander that has to forge an army from scratch. He has to really have that leadership skill up in order to make it across orc held territory. He commissions Tiber as his NCO, he conscripts a few civvies as his logistics corps, and he has a tech slash morale officer named Felicia, a huddy babe tech priest that gets a good amount of characterization, and Kane also gives her his special sauce, also giggity. His army then confidently strides across the waste, picking up survivors and slaughtering orcs when they get dumb enough to voluntarily fight Kane. Old Demon Killer is probably jealous. There are all kinds of good character moments too, like when Kane befriends a weirder loner named Colfax. I remembered that desert busted for years after I first read the book. He helps Kane find some water and gives him his first true command test. Kane and Co come upon a desert shack, and Colfax finds a bottle of booze, and Kane and Colfax have a battle of wills. Kane wants it to be used for medicine, and Colfax wants to get shit-faced due to having no confidence that they will survive. Kane wins out, and the novel mentions that Kane wasn't sure if he could have shot Colfax over the booze. Pure Han Solo style goodness. It's thanks to these side characters that the novel is so good, as it gives Kane a living world to interact with. The novel ultimately culminates in an epic battle at a damn damn damn. Under that damn damn, there is a road that army group Kane can use to bypass orc filled mountains. But as the water drains, the orcs catch up to them and Army Group C has to hold the line. For a book that is only 400 odd pages and from the first person perspective, there are sure a lot of bloody characters. Yeah, Kane is a big ass, I mean badass motherfucker, and kicks all the ass and screws all the girls and is a commander that Clint Eastwood would envy. And yes, we need to give old Clint some rejuvenate treatment so he can play Kane in the movie. But if you took all the supporting characters out of the book and focused only on Kane, this novel would have been shysa. Kane is a people person, and he is at his best when he is able to play off other cool characters. Sergeant Tiber and his bros all play a role in the plot, and one even has to dispense some discipline to characters that while having a minimal role, still make the novel that much better. Felicia is a great leading lady as she plays the important role of mechanic, but she is also funny and takes the piss, ew, ew joke aborted. In short, she kind of does her own thing and makes Kane want to pull his hair out. Jurgen is a good Chewbacca and has a few funny lines here and there and even dresses up as an orc to get them through a checkpoint. Sandy Mitchell gave us an entire world to immerse ourselves in and did not just give us a story where the best is ever faffed for the audience. Orcs, 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 da na 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 na, orcs. Orcs were made for fighting and winning. If you never read a 40k book before, you will leave this book with a hearty appreciation for the orcs. This novel explains what they are and shows us their culture of crumping firsthand, and canonizes some of the memes. The red ones go faster, and the orc tech, unlike the game bro engine, just works, even though to Felicia's eyes, it really shouldn't. The novel also shows a rare glimpse into the day-to-day -day life of the Imperium, and on a world like Perilla, it's not too terrible for the average civvy, and it shows that the average Imperial is just a simple being trying to make their way through a bloody dangerous universe. Death or Glory doesn't have too many issues. There were a couple of annoying deus exes that at least worked in universe, and I wasn't annoyed when I read them. There were a few combatives that required a bit too much luck to pull off, and also, space exists. Why couldn't the imps just drop rocks on the orcs? During Kane's march to the sea with Army Group C, the imps have a ringside seat but never do anything to help, though they really should have the tech to do so, but just repeat to yourself it's just a sword so I should really just relax and hit him with it. Kyphus. 
Kane, ladies and gentlemen, is a top tier mill SF series and is Alpha Prime as a whole. And this novel is Alpha Prime of Alpha Prime. This is one of my top 10 novels. It's got some of the best characters and plots and Kane is one of the top tier protagonists despite his PTSD protests otherwise. He is like old Han in that he is a fun and cool dude to read about and is genuinely a nice guy. The best part is that he fits perfectly into the darker nature of the setting due to all the deaths of his army bros. If you saw the Astarte short film or just watched the 40k memes and wanted to see what all the wine was about, then look no further than Death or Glory. And so, I am General Otz wishing you good Eye of Terror and good Space Wolf or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you this great content. General, want to see big boobs, or barring that, a big boom. And while the novel is short on boobage, although Kane does describe Felicia filling out after getting to eat, oh yeah, orcs, uh, work their slaves to death, all the more reason to abhor the Xeno. But Felicia boobies aside, we get a big boom. The dam's dam generator is overcharged and unless the water is let out slowly, it will explode and destroy the dam dam. Army Group C is elevated above where the water will go and so Kane does the epic. Also, sadly, Colfax buys it during the battle, which makes Kane sad both in this book and in Kane's last stand. So yeah, dude is feeling some major guilt by his second century. So yeah, the dam gets blown and ejaculates all that sweet water over the orcs and 6,000 are slain in the name of the immortal god emperor. But the epicness ain't over yet. Kane and co now have to run the gauntlet back to Imperial lines. They stop off at another supply point only to find the final boss. Yes, Kai has to use the Kung Fu to take down the orc war boss. A war boss on the tabletop, apparently, according to what I've read, can kill a chaos sorcerer. So Kane, with his low hit points, shouldn't stand a chance. But he pulls some Dark Souls shit and blows the green scum sucker's head clean off. The novel points out that Kane, while saying frack, aka BSG for life, aka fuck, a lot, doesn't use worse profanities. Scum sucker in universe is likely the equivalent to a different kind of sucker in ours. And it's good to see Kane showing emotion of this sort. Kane should be pissed off. That bastard killed millions of people and many of Kane's own friends and allies. Felicia was at the battle, and by this time in the novel, she has her own power loader. And yes, like in Aliens, it has its own Flammenwerfe, which Felicia uses to flash fry some knobs, aka Orc Nobles. She also recorded Kane's fight, so she actually helped Kane on his rise to Hero of the Imperium. And the novel ends with Kane and Army Grup C rejoining the imps in a really touching and emotional scene. The end. Holy shit, how do you follow that up? Sandy was on a roll. The next two novels would be just as good. Duty Calls was this novel's direct sequel and would carry on the plotline from Death and Glory. When Kane and Co. found the dam, they also found a few chunks of tech priests laying around, and Duty Calls explains what happened. This novel also features Amberly Vale quite heavily, and she gets her own mech suit that is gold and filigreed. She got that pimp style, lads and lasses. The Kane and Amberly stuff is good fun, and really, there is no way Amberly would date a space pussy. Even though Kane says he is one, there is no way she would suffer a fool to live. There's also a lot of cool side characters such as Zamelda, a punk food vendor turned Inquisition agent, a Kim Hound that was a former commissar that went nuts and killed 12 of his men. The plot is two-tiered. You got Tyranids and Chaos, and Kane has to help save the day again. Kane's Last Stand would be the final part of the Perilla trilogy and would take place on that planet. The novel is chronologically the latest in the Kyphus Kane series and takes place in M42 instead of M41, and it's set during the events of Fabledon's 13th Black Crusade. At the time of the novel's publication, we had no idea that Big Poppy G was going to make his triumphant return, and we had no idea that there was going to be a great rift or anything like that. The novel is outwardly similar to earlier Kane novel, Traitor's Hand. Kane and co. have to hold a planet against a chaos invasion, but this book is way better due once again to having great characters. Since this novel takes place later in his life, Kane is an old bastard, Clint, 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 but due to 
Imptech, he is still physically able to wreck shit up, and he now teaches at an academy, aka the Scala Progenium. He has a bunch of cadets that he has to teach, and the cadets are cool enough, and there's one that I swear is supposed to be his son. Commissar Cadet Donal. McDonald's has a cool moment wherein he holds the line while Kane and company escape Chaos Spes Marines. Then later in the novel, Kane meets up with Donal, and sadly, Donal has been driven mad by the book's villain, and Kane has to put him down in a really, really sad scene. Yeah, Kane books can be funny and fun, they can also punch you in the gut here and there. Felicia returns as a Magos, and sadly, she ain't as pretty as she used to be, since the entire top of her head is now made of metal. But you take what you can get, I guess. The novel is a great send-off for Rilla, and was, in my opinion, the last of the god-tier Kane novels. The rest of the Kane books, while not bad and still good in their own right, would follow the Kane formula. Caves, boss fights, same lines. Although, a recent enough Kane audio drama was kick ass. This audio drama had Kane fight against a female dark elder that wanted to break out the nightstick and hurt him real, real bad. He was under pressure, but Kane did indeed shout, be gone, thought, and lo, did the dark Eldar thought be gone. A recent Kane short story was also pretty bloody good and had him fighting some zombies, and a cool enough character even turned into a zombie. But the last Kane novel was not that great until the very end. Choose Your Enemies had Kane and company land on an ice planet. Uh, some caving was involved, and there was a follow-on from an Amberly Vale short story. But the end. Holy shit. The Final Batu had Kane and company going up against Kane's stalker demon ex-girlfriend. And then epically, the Eldar show up and drop an avatar of Kane down on Kane's demon crazy ex-girlfriend's head. A middling novel with an epic ending. Kane needs a novel where he finally fights on a dark Eldar ship like he has commented throughout all of his bloody adventures. Write that bloody book, Sandy! Get it out, finally! And he also needs to team up with Big Booty Rabooty Gilliman and kill some shit during the Indominus Crusade. Kane is still canonically still alive during the Indominus Crusade. Come on, Sandy, get to fucking work already, man! As Warhammer grows ever greater in popularity, a Warhammer movie becomes more likely. Ultramarines doesn't exist as heresy. And I get it is most likely that GW will use the Spes Marines. Most likely it's going to be those bloody Primaris bastards for the films. As the Primaris and the Spes Marines sell the most plastic. But seriously, Kane is the much better her choice for a Warhammer film. For one, it's not a guy wearing a garbage can, and for another, he can be played by a charismatic actor and thus get some asses in seats, if only for that. I'm thinking one of the Chris's would be a good choice, or Robert Downey for an older Kane. Death or Glory would make for a good Kane movie, since it's a desert escape story, and thus not too Baroque for normies. You could have Chris Pratt or Evans as Kane with Nick Frost as Jurgen, and that film would print money. But even though the Primaris will get the movie, Kane will always have the glory.